My name is Roger Berkowitz. I'm the founder and academic director here at the Hannah Arendt Center at Bard College. Uh, thrilled to be with you today for the virtual reading group. Uh, we are continuing to read Arendt's uh, essay collection edited by Jerome Cohn, Responsibility and Judgment. Um, we're in the midst of this, uh, of the long uh, lecture course, uh, some questions of moral philosophy, which um, we talked about, I think, in the first uh, re in the first time we read it, our first session, that it was uh, composed of two courses, one at the New School and one at the University of Chicago. Um, you know, this is one of the um, one of the few places where RN sort of directs herself specifically at the question of morality. Um, another place will be in the next essay we read when we finish this called Thinking and Moral Considerations. Um, and uh, another place is is really in um, the life of the mind in the section on willing. Uh, and you'll see, uh, and if you've read the material, you'll see, you have seen, but if not, you'll see that um, the question of the will uh, is going to come in and play a big role uh, in in her thinking here uh, in the second part. That said, um, uh, the focus today, uh, which we're reading part three of some questions of moral philosophy is still gonna be on, on the question of thinking. It switches to will at the end. And then um, in our next session in part four, uh, we'll talk more about the will as well, but it'll come up and um, you're welcome to begin asking about it. So uh, to just jump right in, the first sentence on page 97 of part three of, think of some questions of moral philosophy states, morality concerns the individual, individual in his singularity. There's a lot in that, and it, it already begins to tell us um, uh, a, a much of what uh, Arendt wants to say here. Um, what does it mean to say that morality concerns the individual in his singularity? Well, the singularity needs to be understood not as a simple one or a singular, but as uh, Arendt, what Arendt will call a two-in-one. Um, it's, uh, it's that I am as a person always uh, split um, into two and I talk to myself i'm in dialogue with myself and it's this uh being split and in dialogue with myself um which uh defines me as a thinking person so first step is morality concerns me in my singularity and insofar as my singularity a i'm a two and one but b and here we're going to get into what's really controversial um, I think quite controversial uh, in in this in this lecture course, in a way that may be one of the more controversial courses that Arendt ever gave. Um, it's not usually seen that way. Um, and I'm not sure if that's because people just don't understand it or they don't read it, or maybe it's not as controversial as I think. Um, but she thinks it's controversial and she'll say this is one of the most objectionable um, points that she'll ever make later in the in this essay, in this lecture course. Um, but what she's saying here is that morality is not based on rules, right? R morality is not based on customs, right? Morality is not based on the mores, the customs, the, you know, we talked about the, the etymology of morality as mores, as sort of what the habits of what people do. It's not based on um, what other people do. It's not based on society. It's the individual in his singularity. That means that morality ba is based on what I decide with regard to myself, as she says here on this first page. That I am to be with myself and judge by myself as I articulate myself in the process of thinking, of thought. Now, I hope you see the controversy here, right? 
The controversy here in its deepest and profoundest sense is that morality is deeply concerned with myself, my singularity, the subjective, thus is not connected to the objective world. Um, that's why this is so controversial. And that's why this, this section, um, which really builds on things that she's been saying earlier, um, is, is, such a, uh, is something that I think needs to be struggled with, right? So if morality is, concerns the individual and a singularity, and thus it's not based on rules, and it's what I decide with regarding to myself as a singular person, but that myself as a singular person is a thinking person and thus a two and one. Morality is concerned with thought. I speak with myself about what happens to concern me. And that is the moral relationship. Now, she then wants to say a few things more to build out that idea of that moral relationship in my singularity. And one is that the moral relationship in my singularity where I'm thinking with myself happens in what she calls solitude. Um, solitude is the mode of existence uh, present in the silent dialogue of myself with myself, right? This is, she defines it this way on, on page 98. Thus, solitude is not being with others, but nor is it loneliness. It's not loneliness where I can be with other people, but feel abandoned or lost and thus um, completely adrift. Nor is it isolation um, uh, where I, uh, I'm sort of separated from other people because I'm not allowed to speak in public or act in public under a dictatorship. Solitude means that though I'm alone, I'm together with somebody else, myself, in a two-in-one. And so the Socratic um, moral uh, idea, which we've been discussing the last few weeks, it is better to suffer wrong than to do wrong. Better to be odds, be at odds with the world than to be odds with myself um, is uh, something I... Uh, it can experience in solitude because it's in solitude when I'm with myself that I can experience being at odds with myself, which um, is something RN thinks any person, moral person, thinking person cannot do. We cannot be at odds with ourselves because we would go crazy. Now, um, I think one of the interesting, um, uh, somewhat addendums to this uh, relates to the question of to what extent morality and thinking are purely experienced by myself, right? And um, we actually had an interest, a very interesting talk at the RN Center uh, two weeks ago by one of our fellows, uh, Jana Basevich, in which she and I got into an interesting argument about this very question. Um, here, right, Arendt says that uh, friendship can, ha can also happen in a kind of solitude, right? I can be in solitude with other people. It's an important distinction. Um, uh, when I'm when I'm talking with uh, another person about issues that concern me, that can be like talking to myself, and thus uh, in conversations with friends, I can also think and be in solitude. So she says this quite clearly on page ninety eight. Uh, where she says, if I am addressed by one person only, and if, as sometimes happens, we begin to talk in the form of dialogue about the very same things either one of us has been concerned with while still in solitude, then it is as if I now address 
another self. And Aristotle called a friend another self, an alos autos. Um, so the point is that I can be in solitude with friends or with a friend at least, and maybe with a few select friends. We can worry or think about that if that's possible, but certainly with, with one friend. Um, in any case, just to re remember where we are, right? Uh, morality concerns the individual in his singularity, not therefore the world of customs and mores and rules. Um, I thus, to be moral, I am engaged with thinking with myself and I decide with regarding to myself, but it's not, and that seems like utter subjectivity. I just decide whatever I want, but, and here's the change. I decide in regard to myself in thought, in thinking with myself, and thus with a limit, right? This is the key. There is a limit to my morality, to my ability to um, uh, determine my own morality, and that limit is myself. I have to be able to be consistent with myself. I have to be able to speak with myself. I have to be able to um, uh, not be in complete opposition to myself. And this is why um, she had brought up in the last section, and she brings up again here, this idea of remembering and its importance to thinking. It's because we humans can remember and can tell history and remember that we can, she calls it, strike roots into the world and make a home for ourselves in the world. The human way of striking roots, um, taking one's place in the world is remembering. And she says, personality grows out of this root striking process. A person who has roots thinks with himself, remembers and talks and thus, and is thus moral. And so on page 101, um, she writes, and I think this is one of the more, again, one of the more um, important lines here. And, I, and if you're interested in, in Arendt's thinking about thinking and morality, uh, to me, one of the most important lines she's written, she says, if he is a, this is the top of, of 101, if he is a thinking being rooted in his thoughts and remembrances, and hence knowing that he has to live with himself, there will be limits to what he can permit himself to do. And these limits will not be imposed on him from the outside, but will be self-set. Um, this is key, right? And again, it's controversial. The standards for moral behavior don't come from society. Don't come from Christianity or Judaism or Buddhism or Muslim, Islam or whatever it is. They come from yourself. And they come from yourself insofar as you're a thinking being who talks with yourself or with your friends. And insofar as you're a remembering being who remembers things you've done and things that have been done. And in remembering creates a world or limits or a home. And in remembering creates a limits of what you think you can do, not what the society tells you what you can do, but what you think you can do. Um, and these limits are variable. They change in different places. There's no absolute morality, right? If one size says, you know, you can, uh, you know, do drugs and another place says you can't do drugs, neither of these has to do with morality for our end. These are customs of place. Morality concerns what I can do and be consistent with myself. And thus, she says that extreme evil doesn't have to do with breaking objective or social codes. It has to do with someone who has no limits that they put on themselves. And so on page 100, she says extreme evil is possible only 
where these self-grown roots, these roots of remembrance and thinking are absent. So I, that's sort of the first four or five pages of this, or six pages of this, this section. And I think they're incredibly important and rich for our thinking about morality, thinking, solitude, friendship, and evil. She then switches to like a, a second um, set of considerations where she says, does thinking improve citizens, right? Um, Socrates believed, she says, that teaching, thinking versus persuading student, uh, young people uh, would improve citizens. Um, uh, and she says, but there's another side to this, the side of the city, which says, no, what Socrates does in teaching people to think is corrupts the youth, teaches them to question all moral standards, undermines morality, and shatters authority and shatters belief. And that Socrates is the height of irresponsibility insofar as he lives a life turned away from the public, a private life. Oh, yes, he talks to young people in the marketplace, in the agora, but these are young people. They're not citizens, right? You know, those of us who teach young people are not engaging in politics. We're educating citizens. We're educating pre-citizens, but we're not yet um uh, engaged in, in, in politics. And so um, she says that to the extent that philosophy is for the young, as Socrates says, um, he is refusing to act as a political citizen. All he does politically is not act when his daemon, his, his demon, his, his other self tells him stop. And so the Socratic idea of thinking, which Socrates says is going to improve citizens can be dangerous in the sense that it all it does is shatter morality um and leaves us nothing left to hold on to no banisters to hold on to um and this is quite dangerous anyone who listens to socrates she says on 103 to 104 is corrupted and loses their standards of behavior um now the only now you can say oh, well, Socrates has an answer for that. Those who are corrupted and lose their standards of behavior learn to think for themselves and judge for themselves precisely in the way I've just explained it through her work, which is that we set internal limits, not external limits, but internal limits based on remembrance and our rootedness and our unwillingness to live with someone we can't abide. But that means that the only people who are protected from doing evil are people who think. And that's a, that's a tall order, right? Well, yeah, this was the conversation I had with Bob last week. Does everybody think? And how often? And how easy is it to think? Um, that's, the, that's the second part. Um, I just, so, and the third part is just to come back to the controversial, and here's where Arendt specifically says what she's doing is so controversial, where she says that what she's saying really is that morality is a fraud in everyday life. When we speak about morality in everyday life, we're all speaking fraudulently. She says those who invoke moral standards are the first to grasp new standards, whatever is accepted by respectable society, and the first and most easily corrupted people. Morality, in her sense, is not people who act according to moral standards. It's only concerned with the self. And as only being concerned with the self is only politically important in what she calls exceptional or borderline circumstances. It never tells you what to do. So anyone who ever tells you, say, it's moral that you must do this, in RN's language, is a fraud. Let's just be I, you know, tell me I'm saying something too clearly or too, but that's what I think she says. All morality can tell you is don't do this, not because someone else tells you not to do it, because it would be inconsistent with your thinking self, with your other self, with your friends. And it would transgress a limit that you set upon yourself as someone who has depth and personality. Uh, 
Um, in this regard, she says that conscience is a feeling, but not a reliable feeling of right and wrong. And it's not a reliable feeling, she says, because it's really only a feeling about conformity with social standards or non-conformity with social standards. You know, she says, I can feel guilty for murdering when I've been habituated not to murder, but I can also feel guilty for not murdering if my government tells me to go and fight and murder. Um, so the point is that conscience guilt uh, is simply a feeling of non-conformity or conformity for her, but not a, not a moral feeling. Evil, however, uh, is something that um, can be opposed not by conscience, but by thinking. Why? Because what thinking does is teach us to have a limit that comes from ourself. And there are, each of us has these limits, if we think, uh, if we are a person. Um, they can't, well, just like Kant's categorical imperative, can't tell us what to do. It can only tell us that the maxim is wrong if it cannot become universal law. It never tells us what universal law is. Similarly, Socrates says that I can't act in ways that I can't live with. He doesn't tell you what ways those are. And so um, she then makes this distinction between transgressions and scandal, something that Jerry Cohn and I were talking about last week. Um, this is a distinction that she first makes actually in the Denk Tagebuch in 1950. It later becomes central to the paragraph on forgiveness in the human condition. Uh, and, and here she's talking about it again. Uh, but the point here is that um, uh, evil regards and is concerned with what she calls personal or subjective criteria. And she says, this is, this is where she says, this is the most controversial part of her considerations. It's just continuing from what I, she, we've been drawing out. Evil is not about breaking social norms. Evil is when I have no internal limits. It's when I cease to think and remember and become a person and set internal limits on my behavior. And then she quotes Cicero and, and Meister Eckhart. Cicero saying, by God, I'd much rather go astray with Plato than hold true views with my enemies. This is a, a quote she also uses at the end of her essay, Crisis and Culture, uh, which um, uh, uh, is, is, is making a similar point there. But the point is that um, uh, evil comes when I give up on my friends and my personality, my self, my other self, my thoughtful solitude self. Evil comes when I have no internal limits. And internal limits are set by my solitude, my thinking, and my friendships. So, you know, you know we're having a conference on friendship next October. This is one of the ways friendship matters in the world. Friendship matters because it's in friendship that I talk with myself, my other self. And I build the internal limits, not the external limits that tell me what I can and can't do. And she says the trouble with the Nazis was that they renounced all these personal qualities and that the greatest evil is per perpetrated by nobodies who refuse to be persons. All right, so that's the, that's the main part of, of, of this uh, third part of the lecture, third, third lecture. She then begins the conversation on will, which she'll continue um, next week. And, and the key takeaway from the discussion on will that we have here in, in this particular lecture of the third lecture of some questions of moral philosophy 
is that thinking is not the only mental faculty in which I, as a person, am split, right? I'm split in a thinker between me and my friend, me and myself, me and my other self. But also in will, uh, which she thinks was discovered uh, by um, Saul or Paul, um, and uh, in will, in which I will and I nil, in which I will to do my desire and I will to follow the law or reason. And these two wills struggle with each other and contest each other. And um, uh, either I will be destroyed or one will win. Um, in, in, her, in her telling, um, will and thinking are similar in that they're two different mental faculties, mental activities in which I uh, am split. But thinking has no has no positive outcome, right? It, it it can stop me from doing things, but it doesn't tell me what to do. Whereas will does have a positive outcome, and thus it's a much more political faculty. It's the faculty of freedom, where I free to act in the world and do things. Um, and uh, Unlike thinking, which is a dialogue, will is a contest. Um, and so uh, she begins to explore that here and we'll explore it more um, in, the, in the final lecture. So I, I'm happy to talk more about will. I, I sort of focused on, on, on thinking because I think that was the real controversial energy of, of this section. And, but happy to talk about either one. Um, as you know, uh, the chat is open. Uh, please be respectful in the chat and you're welcome to engage with the ideas uh, and other people's ideas, uh, or you can raise your hand and um, participate in the public discussion as well. Uh, I love this section. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed it and uh, look forward to the discussion. All right, uh, James, you're up first. Roger, I loved this chapter. I just, I read it three or four times. I felt like it was giving me a way to a ladder out of the excrement of current life. And I climbed out of this pool and I stand on the top, I open my eyes and all of a sudden I go, yes, solitude, yes, remembrance, yes, rootedness. And I go, wait a second, hold it, baby. Where the hell is that in this world? There's so much. There's, I mean, I'm reading why we're why we're polarized by Ezra Klein. What? Where do we get to be in solitude? Where do we get remembrance now? Where do we get our rootedness? Um, there's so much. Uh, and I just dove right back into the pool. I just can't. It, it, the world that we've created in the last 20 years just prohibits what I want to do in this chapter. Any clues as to where I should go? I'm, I go out in my garden and I weed. And that's it. It's just me and the weeds. And I, I, I just don't know how to get out of it. Thanks, James. Um, I, someone should make a, a, a Google Doc of James' expressions when he expressed... Climbing the ladder out of the excrement. I love it. Um, yeah. I think, you know, on the one hand, you're making an important point, right? Which is that solitude, which is the experiential presupposition of thinking, requires a certain... Um, existential environmental uh uh world we need a certain kind of quiet right we need a certain um uh refuge um and in a world in which we're assaulted by technology sounds you know beeps phones watches whatever it's increasingly hard to to have that um but you know i look at you and your 
office there and it's a pretty cool place to hang out and think uh weeding gardening but the point is not to just be alone right no uh the point is to engage in this conversation with yourself and and i would say you know i think i mean again this is the conversation i had with my our fellow who gave a really great talk on this a couple of weeks ago yana masivich um you know i think there's a tendency in reading arendt to think of solitude and thinking as primarily activities we do with ourselves in thought and there's no doubt that that's a good part of what she's saying um and i think it's right and it's hard you have to train yourself that when you're alone thinking you don't listen to music <laughs> right and you don't right. you don't put on uh uh facebook or tiktok or or you know or don't read the new york times let's be honest or don't read the wall street journal I mean, to the extent that you read the Wall Street Journal or the New York Times to pass the time. You need to let yourself be bored a little bit. Yes. Um, you know, Martin Heidegger in, in his lecture, Foundations of Metaphysics, you know, it's a 400 page meditation on the importance of authentic boredom for thinking. Um, uh, you need a certain bestimmung in Heideggerian's language, a, a kind of attunement. Uh, uh, to to letting yourself um not be occupied with time and affairs and other things um how do you train yourself to do that right i mean i'll take that as the question you're asking um and it's not an easy thing but what i i guess what i was saying with before was i think there's an overemphasis to think of this only as being alone and thinking in solitude Thinking with your friends, right? I mean, I think this is one of the few times where RN says specifically that the two-in-one of thinking in solitude can also be with another real person. Um, and I take that as a real important addition because in many ways, taking a walk with a friend when you take a walk with yourself, you can let your mind think and you can try and, but you're, you know, I mean, I'm just going to be honest. My mind often wanders, you know, you go in other places, who knows, but when you're having a serious conversation about a moral or, or about a predicament that you have, uh, something that happened in your life or in your friend's life, um, you end up being focused into thinking. Um, and so that's why I think uh, friendship is such an important part of uh, what we're talking about here. What would she have said today? I mean, if she had written this, would she have been able to write this today with all the, the, the explosion of information coming at us? You know, I, I can, you know, obviously I can't answer that. Um, uh, I don't know what she could have done or what she would have done if she were living today. Um but you know, I, I I certainly I certainly think there are still, God say dunk, opportunities for us to be alone in solitude. I think there are times when we can think and talk to ourselves, and there are people friends I have who I think with. Um, they're few, but they're there, and. Uh, um and i and you know there are and 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 there are rituals that people engage in right you make yourself a tea you sit out in the garden and you ask yourself questions now it's easy to sort of sit in the garden and tea and think about whatever the movie you're seeing or that you want to go do this you want to go do that but um there are moments, I think, when most of us actually ask ourselves hard questions. And uh, I think that's what she has in mind. I love it. I, I, as I do do that. And then when I put, I have no doubt that you do it. No, I'm just, I go into, I go into the world 
and it's boom. You know, Jerry Manda wrote a book, Four Arguments for the Elimination of Television. And after he wrote the book, he said the fifth one was the most important is tell all of this media gets rid of our downtime. And our downtime is where we rejuvenate, we get bored, we become creative, we imagine because we're quiet. But woof. Okay, I'm thank you for listening. Yeah, no, but I mean, but I mean, I think the important part. I mean, the one important part is exactly what you've been asking about, right? Which is the actual experience of thinking and talking to oneself is a is difficult, both because it challenges us in our persona, and also because it's hard to find the space and the time today to do it. The second part of it is that it's it's deeply controversial and dangerous insofar as what it says is that morality really is about the self. It's not about social mores or norms. It's not what the Bible tells you or what the constitution tells you or what the laws tell you or what the faculty handbook tells you. And um, that's the controversial part of what she's saying. Uh, Miriam. Thank you. Yep, thank you. Thank you. Um, Roger, I'm just wondering if you could read this chapter into the Eichmann book. Um, yeah. Just because the, I'm thinking of the sentences, a couple of sentences in there where she says that about Eichmann, because you will not share the world with others, we cannot share the world with you. Mm -hmm. And I've always taken that as a kind of bedrock for, um, you know, social behavior um, with Arendt. And, and so I'm just, I, I'd just like to hear you read the chapter into that, if you could. Thank you. Yes. Well, I mean, first of all, um, this whole lecture series is her attempt to come to grips with the Eichmann um, situation and controversy and the reality of Eichmann. Um, just like she writes in the introduction to the life of the mind, um, the very idea that she comes up with that it might be thinking which could inoculate us against evil uh is 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 an idea um that she um first contemplates um after seeing eichmann and thinking of him or understanding him as thoughtless and banal and coming to to wonder and 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 believe and at least ask the question that if great evil is done by nobodies non-persons who don't have these internal limits um maybe thinking in which i talk to myself and thus set internal limits on myself might be the only way to uh, inoculate us against great evil, right? So, so that's the um, that's the uh, the background for all of her thinking about morality in in these essays and in the life of the mind. Um, uh, the and so yes, I I mean I think the the Eichmann book is the generator of these ideas, and uh, many of and her concern with Eichmann as a thoughtless, banal figure is not only in the background. I mean, she's she's talking about it here, right? When she says Nazis were nobodies, she's talking about Eichmann, and but not just yeah. Eichmann, many others. Um, you know, the, the 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 section of the Eichmann book which you just cited from, which is the the very end, um, where she um, uh, issues her own judgment of Eichmann. Um, this is what Jerry Cohn and I were discussing last week at the end of the uh, virtual reading group, if you were on last week. Um, uh, I, I have written extensively on this final speech, I mean, um, and, and, and argued that, and still believe, uh, that what she's doing in that final speech is saying um, that whereas the Israeli court uh, needed to find a kind of rule or legal ground that Eichmann violated. Um, uh, she thinks that what needs to be done is simply a judgment uh, needs to be made 
that uh, what he did was evil outside of any laws because there was no law for what he did or against what he did. Um, and that uh, what he did was an attack on human plurality, right? An attack yeah. the, on, on, on the very idea of, of, of freedom and plurality. And what and if you look at page 109 here in, in this book, in, in, in some questions of moral philosophy, yeah. um, she she distinguishes what she calls a transgression from a scandal. Yeah. Um, transgressions are what you can forgive. So in in the in the human condition on the chapter on forgiveness, what she's basically arguing there is that um action which always is going to have unintended consequences because we can't know the consequences of our action. Action um, is, is, necessitates the assumption of forgiveness because you can't act knowing that you, have, you can't control the consequences of your actions, that great evil might come from your actions if you don't have the assumption and assurance that you will be forgiven for what your actions unleash. Um, but she says forgiveness in that sense only goes to what she calls transgressions, um, offenses, uh, you know, mild, what we might call misdemeanors. Um, but true, uh, true scandal, um, true wrongs, um, like what Eichmann did. And what Eichmann did was not kill anyone, right? What Eichmann did was um, uh, obey and support an evil regime. And in doing that, um, uh, make possible mass murder. And, in, and he did that by thoughtlessness. But that uh, is what she would call a scandal, a stumbling block. In Hebrew, uh, a mikshol or a zor, mi, zor mikshol, which means stumbling block. Hmm. Um, and these stumbling blocks cannot be removed from our path as mere transgressions can. They can't just be forgiven. Um, and that's where she says, um, you must be thrown into the sea with a millstone around, uh, hanged around your neck. And that's what she says to Eichmann. You know, you must be hung and, ex ex you know, basically uh, uh, eliminated from this world not as punishment for a crime, but as a, a, a signal of, um, our, of the wrongness and the evil which you represent, which we cannot reconcile to. We cannot love a world in which we, we, in things that you and people like you did and things that you did are in it and not responded to. And, and so, yeah, I think um, the Eichmann book uh, is... And so in that, in the Eichmann book, she says, my judgment is not a legal judgment. It's an, it's my judgment. Right. Mm -hmm. And the judges, she said, sort of had the courage to speak in that voice of my judgment. Um, it's just and, Roger, it's just simply that um, when she speaks about thinking in solitude, it seems interned. And when she, when she speaks in the Eichmann book about, plurality the significance of plurality it seems outward turned and that was what was was uh was uh, was a question in my mind well uh eichmann didn't think he didn't yeah. have that internal conversation what she's saying is to judge eichmann we need to have that internal conversation okay. um and what we judge him on right mm -hmm is whether he um, was evil or not. Or whether he did evil or not. And whether his evil can be forgiven or reconciled with. And what she says is, we have to have the courage to judge and reconcile sometimes, but also to not reconcile and say what he did cannot be reconciled. Mm -hmm. and, and that's... Um, and and that's what I think she says in that book. The 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 the, the idea of plurality is, is 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 what is what he is 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 sort of what his crime uh, ignored and tried to extinguish. 
but the internal conversation is um should i forgive this man or should i reconcile with the world and him in it or is he someone who simply cannot be allowed to exist in the world that's the moral question that i must ask myself and i have to have limits for it mm -hmm. okay Thank that's you. how i that's how i understand it yeah uh george hold on it's interesting in the sense that we're talking about thinking and uh, willing which are terms that have been around forever i just want to go into a, another term that's more recent and has to do with these to look at it a little bit different way because it has always bothered me about and that's agency now agency again one 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 way i i like to look at it is agency is a choice set is the degrees of freedom that is how many degrees of freedom you have or choices to act in a certain situation which really is morality comes down that's you know you can think or it comes down to action or inaction now, when you think of it that way, then, you know, it, ha it has to be in context. You cannot be yourself against the world or yourself and one friend against the world because the context of making decisions, of acting, is, is not only dependent on the so-called self, but dependent on, on the situation you're in, on the context. So she really doesn't deal with that particular thing and and uh, you know when you're when you're talking with yourself then you have confirmation bias as i said before if you're talking with a friend then you're you know a friend who thinks like you then you're getting into the identity politics thing and and uh, the narcissism with small differences and you don't consider anything else so it's it, once you think about in it as far as as far as agency, how you can act in a certain situation, it's very hard to make it you yourself against the world or you and a friend against the world. Maybe you want to comment on that. Yeah, thank you. Um, so one answer is yes. Um, you know, she doesn't talk about agency because she doesn't think that thinking and morality um are contextual in the way you've presented it um she doesn't think it matters if you're in ancient athens or nazi germany or 20th century new york or 21st century new york you're um that in moral questions the question is i'd rather be at odds with the whole world than at odds with myself um or out of tune with the you know, the whole world rather than out of tune with my own liar, my own self. Uh, you say, though, you know, so I think on one sense, you're right. She's she's not, um, you know, morality is, as she states very clearly, uh, you know, in the very beginning on page 97, uh, morality concerns the individual in his singularity, not uh, contextuality, not in, in public. Now, so all of that I agree with, and and I think you're you're right about. Uh, where I would quibble, or maybe more than quibble, I don't know, uh, is when you say that when I talk to myself, I have confirmation bias, or when I talk to my friend, I'm in the narcissism of small differences. Um, uh, there's no reason that I should be friends with people who are like me. There's none. In fact, I think you could even argue that it's harder to be friends with people who agree with you and are like you. A true friend is someone who's going to push you, who's going to challenge you, who's going to um, think from worlds outside of your own. And I actually think it's much easier to be friends with someone you disagree with than someone that you agree with. Um, because if you agree with someone all the time, you're not going to have many deep conversations. There's just not going to be that much to talk about. 
And I think one of the problems we have today is that we have this idea that your friend should be your like supporter or whatever. And yeah, I mean, a friend should support you, but they should also push you. Um, and you know, uh, I think, and I think if you think with yourself, if you're a good thinker, you should be very hard on yourself. And you should push yourself to consider, you know, where you are wrong. Um, I mean, I certainly, you know, again, I think we, I think we have this idea of friendship as a thumbs up today. I don't think that's what friendship is. Um, and so I don't, that's all I would quibble with, right? Is I think that you can, you don't have to see a friend as a, uh, as 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 identity polit what you called it identity politics or um when you you said narcissism small differences i mean i you know i mean who knows who thinks of me as a friend or whatever but i think of a lot of the people i think of as friends are people who really disagree with me about things and have strong strenuous but thoughtful disagreements with me but in a way that's respectful and i find that to be some of the most alive parts of my life anyway if that's okay barbara um I, I wanted to talk a little bit about parents teaching trying to teach their children uh, about being being good or not being bad and i mean i think there's some saying you know x is wrong or y is right uh, this is kind and this is mean, but I think th there's a lot of uh, encouraging children to think about what another child is feeling as they are knocking down that other child's sandcastle. And it's sort of asking the, the child to go into the other child's mind. How would you feel if that child did to you what you just did to them? And um, there's a lot, if you if you hang out in playgrounds, as, as I do as a grandmother, there's a lot of that kind of talk going on. And so it's, um, it is encouraging a kind of, a kind of reflection and thinking. And, and it is also encouraging a, a kind of recognition that you are not the only human being in the world, that these other people that you're sharing the playground with are, are also human beings. And even though you don't feel it, um, they deserve the same, the, 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 the same, the, or, they deserve the same experience as you do. And so I, I, I think that's a, it's it's not a kind of moral principle like always tell the truth, but it is a kind of a moral point of view that other human beings are of value like you, and and to encourage one to reflect on how they might feel and to think of them in that way. And in 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 reading in reading the chapter although i really um loved it also i mean i you almost have the feeling that there's no way to teach somebody how to or, or to encourage somebody to to support them in learning what it is to be a good person because you don't know it either and and yet i feel that that's so intrinsic to what we do with children that's my comment. Thank you very much. Um, it's a wonderful comment. Um, so uh, yeah, um, I teach a course called the Foundation of Law, and uh, it's a course that I've been teaching for over twenty years, and I actually learned it from one of my mentors and advisors, Philippe Donet. Mm -hmm. And one of the questions we ask in it is, "How do you teach morality?" <laughs> a big section of the course um and um there are a number of things we read in it uh 
I, I highly recommend Dorothy Lee's book, um, Culture on Freedom, I think, or A Culture of Freedom. I'm sorry, I'm blanking on the name. Um, but the key text in it is a footnote in Kant's Groundwork of the Metaphysics and Morals, uh, where he has been, he says, I've received a letter from uh, the late professor, I think it's Sulzer, if I have it right, someone can tell me if I have it wrong. Um, and, you know, it's always a funny thing to say because it took him so long to answer the letter that the guy died. Um, <laughs> uh, but, and the letter asked, how do you teach morality to your kids? And, 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 and Kant says, it's taken me a while to, to figure this out, but the only way to teach morality is by example, not by telling them what to do. Um, so you, you, you gave a wonderful story uh, about being on the playground and you don't say to your kids, you know, you should use the slide once every 30 seconds, right? But you say, um, think about how the other child feels by you constantly being on the slide or, or something like that. Um, and I think that's already doing something right. It's teaching the child to let their mind go wandering in a Kantian or Orentian sense, to think from the perspective of others. Um, and so one way, but it's still teaching them. It's still telling them. And, you know, what I would say is this, the only way to really teach people morality, if you are Arentian, if I am understanding Arendt correctly, Arendt correctly, is to teach them to think. And the only way you teach them to think is by thinking with them. And I think I said this one or two weeks ago, I can't remember anymore. But the reason liberal arts colleges matter is not because they're expensive. I don't know if they're worth it, but they have the capacity in small groups to put faculty in front of students and let the students see what it is to think. And that's the only way to teach people to think. Now, parents can do it too. You can, you know, if you tell your children, be polite to those who serve you and you then are not polite to your waiters or people working at the counter in an airport, what do you think your children are going to learn, right? They're not going to learn what you tell them. They're going to learn what you do. Um, and so, uh, you know, learning by example, teaching by example, really is the only way to teach morality. Um, uh, and in the end, your student, your kids will have to make their own judgments and they'll figure it out for themselves. Um, and if you try and force morality down their throats, um, not only will it not work, it will probably uh, be counterproductive. Um, that's my own, you can, that's the parenting lesson of the day. Uh, uh, you know, um, but that's, that's how Kant and Arendt understand it. And uh, I remember when our first child was about to be born, I reread Emile by Rousseau and made a list of the recommendations Rousseau makes about how to raise children, give them bracing cold baths so they don't get used to comfort and things like that. And my wife didn't think those were great parenting ideas, but um, uh, in any case, um, you know, Arendt and Kant were not, neither of them had children, <laughs> neither of them were parents, and yet they offer us some, I think, interesting and wise advice. Susan. So I'm wondering how this idea of memory um, figures in, because if we're using memory as a way of setting limits, isn't memory all of the things we've been taught and all of these 
moral principles and everything we've experienced what are we remembering that's setting limits except all this stuff wow oh, great um what are we remembering yeah um uh well that's that's what what we remember right uh i would hope or, or i think con i mean let's let's just um what do we remember we remember what matters to us um we remember that which has stuck out to us um culturally we remember what 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 people have agreed on right i mean if if i go through a path in the woods and it will be forgotten but if i go through a path in the woods and 30 people follow me and they make a you know an indentation in the grass because they think it's a good path it gets remembered um so you know in a way that's how customs happen uh, and that's how um cultural memories get made one person does them two people do them and they become copied does that make them right no it doesn't uh they're customs but it's um it makes them socially meaningful um uh what you remember are the things that either bother you or make you happy or make you sad um uh and so uh, you know they are the things that make you you right they're the things that make a culture a culture so you know in the united states we remember Paul Revere, and we remember the Constitution, and we remember George Washington and John Adams, and um, you know Martin Luther King and uh, Susan B. Anthony, and these are the things we remember, and they build up who we are as a country, right? You remember, you know, what your parents told you one day while you were sitting on you know a bench, or what you know your friend whispered to you before they died, or whatever it is you remember those things and they make you who you are they they make you deep they dig deep into you and and make you you know a person and they that personhood is the person you are that you can't disappoint and you can't live with yourself if you disappoint that person. And that's the person who sets your limits. I'm not sure I can be much more specific than that. I mean, it depends on each person. See, it's easier for me to speak about the United States or about Athens or whatever, because then we have a public set of memories. Do you understand what I mean, Susan? Yeah, I, I do. But I, I still think that you know, these are these customs and and messages and teachings and all of these things where she's trying to say this is only coming from you. This is only coming from the self. And yet what you're describing is the self is made up of all of these teachings and experiences and cultural norms and beliefs. That's what's in there setting limits. Um, seems yeah. to me. I mean, every self has their own particular memories and limits. Not exactly. I mean, we you, you're describing we, we share these cultural beliefs and you know the Constitution and you know these supposed you know founding fathers of you know we share those. That that's well, not a. I made a distinction. You know, I'm I'm trying to do what Plato. Did. This sounds so arrogant. I'm trying to do what Plato did in the Republic, which is to use a big example to understand a little example, right? He right. used the Republic to understand the soul. I'm saying there are cultural memories and political memories, right? And they are important. 
Um, and then there are my personal memories. Now, if I'm a person who has memories of the time I went to the Lincoln Memorial and read the words, and I had memories of the time um, I watched inauguration and I heard the poem by, you know, whoever it was, Amanda Gorman or whoever else. And I'm a person who, when I hear um, uh, uh, John F., you know, say, don't ask what your country can do for you, but you can do for your country. If, if those matter to me, then my Americanness, as I've interpreted it, matters to me. And that becomes part of my personal limits. But if I'm a person who doesn't particularly like America and doesn't feel a lot of patriotism, those things may not be part of my internal limits, right? Um, and so uh, I may have other, you know, things that have been meaningful to me. And some of them are public things like that, but some of them may be the experience of a bird sitting next to me, you know, uh, out in nature or leaves falling from a tree in a way that made me think of uh, the, the fragility of life. And, and that's a part, you know, I can't tell you what makes up James or you or George or any of these other folks on this call. Um, this is the, you know, this is the, the, the controversy, the objectionable part, right? Which is that each of us has our own memories and our own limits persona um there's going to be one would hope that amongst people living together in a city or a country or a world there are some common memories right i mean that's that's the challenge of politics is to build common memories that actually matter to us collectively but um there's also each of us has our own personal person. And, and most of us, our personal person is a combination of our collective, of different collective persons, you know, as a Jew, as a white man, as a American, as a professor, as a husband, as a father, all of these different, you know, parts of my personality come in and, you know, become who I am as a person that would set limits for me as I think with myself. But Arendt also talks about passing on the traditions, I think in her essay on education, talks about the importance of passing on these traditions. Um, so we are trying to influence that across the population. Absolutely. I mean, you know, she, what she's saying there is that part of education is passing on the collective memories and traditions that define who we are as a people so that the next generation can either can both know that and embrace and love where they come from but also say here's the limits of it here's where it's unjust here's where it's inadequate and here's where we have to change it but she says you can't make progress you can't change the world without knowing deeply the pull of that world because if you just set yourself up as a radical right who is going to change the world and suddenly make it just and you don't understand the power of the world you were born into to pull and attract people you'll you won't succeed the difference between a radical and a revolutionary is that a radical seeks to just overturn and change, whereas a revolutionary seeks to circle back and remake the world according to its best ideas even better. And, and that, she says, the problem with, with, left or, or progressive politics today is that we have too many radicals and not enough revolutionaries right they don't know they don't they don't try and reinvigorate the tradition to make it better they seek to just overturn it and um she thinks that won't work because there are always going to be people in the world attached to the world we live in who love the world and so the only way to change it is to sort of 
learn what's lovable in it and also what's hateable in it and go back and re-energize the lovable to make it better. Greg. Yeah, hi. I think maybe, uh, Roger, you might have already sort of gotten at this question in your response to Susan, but I'll ask anyway. The question can even really be answered. But I wanted to hear a little more as to why Arendt thinks that remembrance and rootedness in a singular or in, a, in any individual would make that person more likely to want to live in agreement with themselves. What is it about that experience that makes living it harmony with yourself important as opposed to somebody who lacks memories and is rootless and more prone to evil? That's, a, that's an interesting question. I'm not, I'm not sure that the causality goes in that direction. I mean, it may be that the traditions and memories you have are of being in harmony with yourself, right? In so far as part of your memory is reading about Socrates. <laughs> but um, I think what she's saying is that um, what Socrates taught is that um, uh, it was better to be in harmony with yourself than not. And that example that he taught, which he did, if he had just taught it, right, we would never remember it. So it wasn't just that he taught it, it's that he lived it, right? He he let himself be killed rather than escape uh, because he didn't want to harm the laws of Athens. And he said, it's best better to suffer wrong than to do wrong. And it's better to um, live myself. And when people said, look, you, we, we'll, we'll let you go as long as you stop philosophizing in public. And he said, no, I'm not going to live that way. I'm only going to live according to my truth. And he died for those beliefs. That example of somebody who died for one's beliefs and lived according to this maxim became one of the central stories of the of 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 Western thought, right? Um, now, this I don't know how I'm, this is. I'm not sure how I'm going to say this, so I'm just going to figure it out as we go along, right? I don't think Arendt is saying this is a universal thing for everybody. Maybe she is. I don't know. I don't think so. I think what she's saying is this idea of morality began in a sense with the Socratic example. And that example has been powerful, at least in Western, in the Western moral tradition. What does that mean for a non-Western moral tradition, an Eastern moral tradition, or an African moral tradition? I don't know. I mean, my guess is, you know, I, I, you, we'd have to think about are there similarities, are there differences, are there other examples? Um, but Arendt, you know, speaks about Socrates as the founder of the Western moral tradition, not the moral tradition to court. Um, and, uh, um, but it's a, it's a moral tradition that's had a lot of impact in the West, but also outside the West, just like there are examples of the Buddha in the East that have had huge examples and influence in the West. Um, so these traditions obviously, um, you know, interpolate each other and, 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 and influence each other. Uh, um, but uh, I guess what I'm saying is I don't think this is a universal moral maxim. It's something that emerged out of a particular history in which uh, a particular thinker, Socrates, was celebrated by another particular thinker, Plato. And that celebration has influenced poetry, art, music, dance, philosophy, literature for 2,000 years. What she says in, in this book is that that tradition largely ended in the early 20th century and that we no longer take it for granted that it's better to suffer wrong than to do wrong. And in a sense, that tradition is over. Um, and uh, 
now we have to ask ourselves, you know, what is morality today? And that's what she's struggling with. I don't think she has a, you know, I mean, uh, you know, to what extent is the Socratic example and the Socratic idea still meaningful today? It's certainly not, I mean, I think what she said, what she would say is, or what she says is, it's not not meaningful, but she says it's no longer taken for granted. Is that, I, I mean, I'm not sure if that answers your question, Greg. Yeah, well, uh, I'm not sure to what extent it can be answered, but I, I'm wondering if, I mean, there's the tradition that we've lost of it's the idea that it's better to suffer wrong than to do wrong, but I never understood Arndt to be saying that it's a tradition that thinking is the two-in-one dialogue with the self. Um, and I never hear her say that that's just sort of part of the human condition, the way she says that plurality is. Um, but I'm wondering if perhaps she smuggles the idea in there that thinking is the two and one with the self and it is a part of the human condition. And therefore, we can always appeal to that when making some kind of moral argument that you should strive to live in agreement with yourself. Well, I mean... Is there, I mean, I, 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 just, I, don't, I don't take you to be saying at all times and at all places throughout the entirety of the human history, thinking has been what Arendt says thinking is, right? I mean, thinking is a cultural, you know, they're, they're, last week, Bob brought up some really interesting points about how he tries to be really thoughtful in his business operations, right? And I think that's right. But the point is, Thinking has meant different things and can mean different things today, you know, and to during different times and different places. When I mean, I, I some of you know this story, but when I first founded the Hannah Arendt Center, I called it the Hannah Arendt Center for Ethical and Political Thinking, not Politics and Humanities. And when I applied for a big grant at the National Endowment for the Humanities, they said, you know, like, we can't give you the grant because you're called a center for ethical and political thinking. I said, what's wrong with that? And they said, well, what does thinking have to do with the humanities? What am I supposed to answer to that, right? Um, but, you know, their view was that thinking is sort of like something that's all over the place. There's no specificity to it. And they wanted to know what specifically our center had to do with the humanities. I mean, it was ridiculous, but that was where it was. But all I'm saying is um, the idea that of the two-in-one is an idea that Arendt takes from the Theotetus and Plato. Um, I don't think it's a claim that that's the only way we can understand thinking. I think it's a claim that that's a way that thinking has been understood by Plato and that it's a meaningful way of understanding thinking that we should make into one of our remembrances and memories so that it becomes part of our tradition. I don't think there's any metaphysical need that that's how we define thinking, if that makes sense. Yeah, right. it makes sense. All right, thanks. Big, big this. Uh, yeah, my question is about the, the relation between conscience and the thinking, and what she says about conscience, and which supposedly is a way of feeling, and uh, the way she kind of, of uh, has this uh, world feeling in what you say when they are like, yeah, the way she, they are written, though. But um, and she also says that this has shown that it's no indication at all of right and wrong. And we know perfectly well, I think, that people, the bad conscience that some people feel comes from different sources. They come from upbringing. They come from what they have learned and so on. And we had for many years back, it was related to religion and to be in, to kind of be inconsistent with the words of God. And then she writes on the top of page 108, conflicts of conscience in secular terms, on the other hand, are actually nothing but deliberations between me and myself. They are not resolved through feeling, but through thinking. And I think this is, uh, does she indicate here that you have in a way, your conscience functioned from your upbringing and you, you kind of, 
when you feel bad conscience, is this because this is what you have been told and have learned? And I know this from people who have been brought up in a very religious home, and they start questioning this, the values they have been learned, and it kind of develops their conscience and how that that kind of conscience ticks in. So, so my question is, she actually goes from conscious conscience to be a feeling that what is supposed to be a feeling, that's what people think. And then she, she says that conflicts of conscience in a peculiar term are not resolved through feeling, but through thinking. So that is what I wonder if she thinks that if we learn to think about things, to ask questions about what we have learned and so on, we also kind of changes had or have the possibility to change our conscience so that we react in different ways. Yeah, that's, uh, I don't, was that the care? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I, I think you're right, you know, uh... The, 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 the practice of the two in one and thinking from the perspective of others is not feeling from the perspective of other, it's thinking, right? I think that's your point. And, and you're absolutely right. Um, so I think it was Barbara earlier who talked about, you know, being on the playground and how would the other child feel? Um, and what I think is really the way of pricing it from an Arendtian point of view is think from the perspective of the others, not how they would feel, but how they would see the matter and how they would think about it and how they would understand it. Um, and, and, and so, yes, um, the kind of uh, enlarged mentality that, that Arendt is, is, is engaged with here is, is one of, of thinking rather than feeling. Um, and I think that's right. Yes, that because I know many people, for instance, who have religious upbringing, for instance, gay people who struggle with this because they have learned, been learning that this is wrong. You shouldn't be like that. You should, should resist it. So my question is really about, do you think she, that if they go, if they use their ability to think this true and maybe also think it's true with friends, that would change their conscience so that they can live with themselves and have a good conscience to live out the, this. That is actually my question, because I think there's a lot of people who struggle with values they have been learned that have kind of been indoctrinated into them through their upbringing, so. Right, so this is more the question of will that we're gonna come to at the end of this, chapter and in the next chapter is the next lecture as well you know um i mean if if you're i'm not sure if i if you're asking me like how to help people feel less guilty is that what you're asking me yes in a way to have a good conscience by living as they are really are and not by living as they have been told they are since it is they are told well, the, well i mean i think you know there's different ways one could imagine answering that question in in a way of conscience you could say just teach them different rules right um but i think the the arentian answer is you shouldn't feel guilty because you're acting and feeling opposed to the, to the way others do. But you also shouldn't feel virtuous because you're acting in ways consonant with the others way others do. You have to have the arrogance, if you let me use such a word, and pride to make your moral judgments on your own. But that, and that's why it's so objectionable and so dangerous because you're, you, you think, oh my God, you're saying, let anyone do what they want. It's anarchy, it's chaos. But she's saying no, because 
as long as the people are thoughtful and have memories and are persons, they have limits. And that's the big if. Do we have people who are thoughtful? Right. This goes back to the very first question by James, right? Where do we learn this stuff today? And isn't this seemingly like out of out of like a, a utopian novel? Who are these thoughtful people who, you know, um, ask if they can live with themselves based on internal limits? Certainly not Eichmann, but people like, uh, you know, Carl Jaspers, right? People like who couldn't act otherwise, as she puts it. Or people like, um, I think it's Corporal Schmidt, who couldn't act otherwise and save Jews. Um, and, 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 you know, not because there were rules against acting otherwise, but because there were internal limits they couldn't cross. And so um, I don't think she thinks everyone in society is ever going to create these strong internal limits. But I do think, here's the, here's the Berkowitz on our end, you know, here's the hopeful, the hopeful spirit of the day, right? The hope is that if enough people think and set internal limits, when politics goes off the rails, those people will at least pull back and not participate. And their thinking, which has no positive telling people what to do, but simply a negative, will make other people start to stop and think. I mean, if you want to put it in the context of the last five or six years of American politics, look, there's plenty of thoughtless people on the left, right? And and there's plenty of people on the left who said some really idiotic things. But no one on the left right now is threatening um, the basic idea of the republic, right? Which is that we have a democratic election and... and um, and and the people who win get elected. How is it that so few people on the right have stopped and exited and said, I cannot participate in the Trump world? So many, we know they know it. I mean, this is where Liz Cheney, you know, is, is, is really a fascinating figure. One of the only ones who really has put herself out there and risked her career on this, on this matter and said that you cannot keep lying and preserve the basic self-government nature of this republic in this way. You don't have to like Liz Cheney for all the stuff she's done, but I think you can't not respect her as a thoughtful person in an Arendtian sense in this regard. And I'm sorry, I just taught Liz Cheney. I just taught a thing about Liz Cheney this week as my last class. So um, it's on my mind, but uh, there you go. I do agree with that though. I Thank you all very much. Um, are we meeting? I can't remember if we're meeting next week or not. I don't know if anyone has the schedule on them, but we, the next time we do meet, we're reading section four of um, some questions of moral philosophy, lecture four. Uh, it's either next week or the week after. Um, if anyone we don't knows. meet next week, we don't meet next week. So we're taking a break for a week. Um, sorry. I have a bunch of graduation, parental graduation duties, um, but uh, we'll meet the week after I hope. And uh Look forward to seeing you all. Enjoy reading Hannah Arendt and we'll see you soon. Thanks all very much.